Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Sorry, Tom. Um, I'm Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. And we want to excited about tonight's special forum. It's a little bit different, so I've got some logistical announcements uh, before we get started. So normally in the forum, one of our rules is we have to take questions from the audience, but this is a live to tape radio broadcast. So we've modified it a little bit to make it work. I think all of you had a chance to get a little white card if you had a, uh, to write a question uh, that'll be considered to be asked during the actual taping of the broadcast. Um, if anybody has one of those cards uh, and has a question written on it, if you want to hold it up, one of the ushers will take the card. Uh, during a couple of the breaks, because I think we have a couple of breaks during the taping, uh, that's another opportunity to submit a question. So maybe something you heard prompted you to write a question, and the ushers will take those cards during the breaks from you. And again, just kind of hold them up during those breaks. At the end of the actual taping, we're gonna, the panel's going to stick around, and we'll convert it to a more of a traditional kind of form. And we'll bring the microphones up, and you'll have a chance to ask more questions uh, in our traditional manner. Uh, they'll be unfiltered and you know, whoever's first come, first serve. But that'll be after the broadcast is over. So does that all make sense, everybody? Okay. Um, also, we're really excited that tonight is, uh, this forum's put together in large part with the help of the Ash Center. It's the 10th anniversary of their, uh, what are they called? The Challenges to Democracy Public Dialogue Series. And so Arkan Fung, who was with the Ash Center, uh, is a professor here at the Kennedy School, is going to introduce the folks on stage and get the thing started. So please join me in welcoming Arkan. Thanks, Trey. This year is the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's address at Gettysburg. Lincoln ended that address with the exhortation that we here highly resolve that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. Many developments right now, not least the shutdown of our federal government, the the historical low approval ratings of our political institutions. Right now, I'm told an open wound is more popular than Congress. <laughs> and the complete disengagement of large parts of our populace indicate that the democratic character of our system is once again in jeopardy. More humbly, this is also the 10th anniversary of the founding of the Ash Center on Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Harvard Kennedy School. We at the Ash Center devote ourselves to understanding the problems of democracy all around the world and exploring ways to solve those problems. We thought it fitting that on the 10th anniversary of the Ash Center, we have a series exploring the most um, important challenges to American democracy and what we as citizens might do to address those challenges. In a series of lectures, films, cultural events, workshops, online activities, and radio programs, we will address themes such as immigration, threats to the principle of one person, one vote, business power, political polarization, the decline of popular movements, and other themes. We begin our series tonight with an exploration of one of, surely, what is one of the greatest threats to our democracy right now, social and economic inequality. To prepare yourselves for this discussion, I'd like you to consider thoughts from two very gifted students of the subject. In 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote in The Social Contract, that democracy can only exist in a society where no one is so rich as to be able to buy another and no one is so poor as to have to sell himself. And so think about whether the levels of inequality in America right now exceed Rousseau's limits. Later on, in the early part of the 20th century, Justice Louis Brandeis said that we can either have democracy in this country or we can have great concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, but we cannot have both. As you're about to hear in a minute, we certainly have great concentration of wealth in this country, and the question is, do we have democracy any longer? Now, it's natural to think of the business of the Kennedy School as improving government for the people rather than government of the people or by the people, but our intention in this series is to engage not just scholars of policy or policy makers, but Americans from all walks of life so that each of us may better reckon the state of our democracy and work to improve it. We will seek to make the best thinking and the convening power of the Kennedy School available to a broader public in Boston and beyond. This series, therefore, in this series, therefore, we will partner with a range of other media and cultural organizations, such as the American Repertory Theater and the Harvard Film Archive. I'm delighted that tonight we're able to join forces 
with one of the premier institutions of the contemporary American public sphere, the On Point program of WBUR and National Public Radio. Now, tonight's event is being recorded and it will be broadcast nationally as the second hour of On Point tomorrow at 11 a.m. Since this program is being recorded and will be rebroadcast on radio, national radio, behave accordingly. <laughs> Please show your enthusiasm by clapping when uh, and at other appropriate moments, but be very silent otherwise. Now we put a face to the voice with which you are all so familiar. Please welcome the master of tonight's discussion, Tom Ashbrook of On Point. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to be here. You know, we do 10 shows a week, 52 weeks a year, and so I am always accumulating material for the show. Those quotes from Rousseau, that quote from Rousseau, I'm grabbing right now. <laughs> you wonder how we do it? This is how it works. Um, it is so great to be here, uh, and with such an, a, a wonderful panel, which I'll introduce to you in a moment, though many of you probably know them very well already, but they're really terrific. I really um, uh, respect the Ash Center for working on this. This is a subject near and dear to our heart at On Point. We've talked a lot about inequality, not because we insist on equality with a capital E in any absolute sense, but there surely, as Justice Brandeis suggested, is a level of inequality at which things get dicey. I think there's a widespread feeling that we are there. Um, we're going to have a show, uh, a show with you and um, in front of you and... Uh, and with your support here this evening. So I, I want to talk, if I may, about a little bit of the sort of procedure of this. Uh, this will go on the air tomorrow, uh, different times locally here at 11 and again at 7 tomorrow night, but at different times around the country. In order to make it possible for my wonderful staff, Eileen and Karen and James, to get this on the air tomorrow, and Sam, my producer who's sitting right here, we need to record it this evening exactly to our time format so they can drop it right into the slots and it will go out over NPR tomorrow. So you will see and feel me exerting the uh, absolute uh, discipline of the clock, which is here. Uh, we will have three segments, as we always do, with little breaks on air, so that they can drop in and have the, you know, things in between. Tomorrow, unfortunately, there's still fundraising going on, so God help us. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but, you know, mama's got to buy shoes for baby. Um, so you will feel me sort of uh, uh, pushing toward that clock. This does require, if you'd be good enough, a little participation from you because our audience around the country will hear immediately that we're in a different space. To make sense of that space, they need to understand that there's an audience here. I know this is an esteemed audience of academics, but if you can make a little noise uh, when we come on the air, the whole thing will make semiotic sense to our audience around the country. It won't just sound like we suddenly got dropped in a fish tank and what's going on. Um, so, in, in just a minute, we're all going to put on our headphones um, and uh, get that very uh, ra radio thing going on. I'm going to read a script, as I always would, in uh, opening up the show, and then it will be all uh, Wild West, as it always is when we do the show. Um, and if you'd be so kind, uh, when I say to our audience here in the hall and listeners around the country, welcome to One Point, if you would be kind enough to applaud, even enthusiastically... <laughs> Uh, this would just be awesome. So, uh, with that little preamble, are we all ready to go? And absolute silence is not required. You know, you can, you can. But um, on the other hand, if you get rowdy, uh, I will be stern with you. All right, good to go. Okay, we can. <clears throat> can you hear me when I'm talking into this now? You can hear me just fine. Good. All right. Um, through the magic of um, taping, we're about to do a radio show, so we're all, we're all on board? Okay, so there's, there's no joking, this is, this is the actual thing. Okay, I've got the sniffles, that's a broadcaster's nightmare. Okay, oh, and let me be sure I've got my, let me be sure I've got my little Brandeis and Rousseau lined up. Thank you so much for that. that was, we grab what we need. Ain't that America? Um, good. <clears throat> okay. You'll be surprised at how quickly this quote shows up from Brandeis 
Try not to laugh like it's a big joke when I use it now. <laughs> okay, good. Panel, are, are you guys all comfortable and ready? Yes. Let, let's, yes, yes. Yes. Yes? Yes. We certainly. hear your voices. We're all, we're all live and good. James, are we good? Eileen? All right. <clears throat> From WBUR Boston, I'm Tom Astrook, and this is a special edition of On Point before a live audience at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in Cambridge, Massachusetts. To our audience here in the hall and listeners around the country, welcome to On Point. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are talking about democracy here in this hall, kicking off a two-year series of programs on challenges to democracy that is being mounted by the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation here at Harvard. Our theme in this hour goes to maybe the biggest area of challenge to American democracy today, democracy and inequality. You might think there's a big challenge to democracy in Washington's shutdown right now. Fair enough, but there's a context. The world's oldest constitutional democracy, the United States, has become one of the developed world's most unequal nations. What does that mean for how our democracy functions or doesn't function? This hour on point, democracy and inequality. We are recording this show before a live audience at the JFK Junior Forum at the Harvard Kennedy School. We've invited questions from our audience here and from our listeners around the country, online, on Facebook, on Twitter, and they have poured in big questions about whether the fundamentals of democracy can be preserved in a country where the gulf between rich and poor is so wide, whether extreme inequality and democracy are fundamentally at odds, and if they are, how do we move forward? So we are loaded for bear here. Let's go. We've got three big thinkers on the issue with me here on the stage. Christian Freeland, Celebrated journalist with the Financial Times, Thomson Reuters, and more, author of Plutocrats, The Rise of the New Global Super Rich and the Fall of Everyone Else, a longtime friend of On Point, now a Liberal Party candidate for the Canadian Parliament. Christia Feeland, welcome. Great to be here. Wonderful to have you right here. Martin Gillens is here, professor of politics at Princeton University, a big voice on inequality and public policy, author of Affluence and influence, economic inequality, and political power in America. Martin Gillens, thank you so much for coming. Great to have you here. Thanks. Great to be here. And with us, Harvard's own Alex Kesar, professor of history and social policy at the Kennedy School and historian with an eye on the now, voting, democracy, poverty, and more, author of The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States. Alex Kesar, welcome. Great to have you right here. All right, so in our warm-up th this evening, and I'm so glad we're sitting here, this, this, I think this is an urgent issue. I'm glad we're talking about it. It's been talked about for a long time. Let me quote two. 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote in The Social Contract that democracy can only exist in a society in which no one is so rich as to be able to buy another and no one is so poor so as to have to sell himself. And Bring it right here to this country, Justice Louis Brandeis, famously, many of us are familiar with this, said, we can either have democracy in this country or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we cannot have both. Martin Gillens, are we getting close with the, everything we're hearing about inequality to the point at which we cannot have both? I think we have reached to that point. Uh, democracy is not a yes or no kind of uh, characteristic. It's a continuum, and we have a degree of democracy that in regard to the responsiveness of public policy to the preferences of the public, a core feature of what it means to be democratic, that that has declined over time as inequality has grown. Uh, and because of this very rise we're seeing, this latest report that came out was 10% of Americans took more than half of the country's total income last year, 1% way up there, sort of uh, up at historic highs as well because of exactly those, that kind of number. The concentration of wealth certainly uh, encourages and abets the concentration of political power. So absolutely these two things are intertwined and as economic inequality has grown over the past three or four decades, political inequality has grown as well. Alex Kesar, we did not have equality at the, begin at the origin of this country. The founders never envisioned any kind of absolute equality. They were very familiar with all different stations in life, different levels of wealth. How did, how did the, they think about this country and 
the distribution of wealth, inequality, and how it might influence the, the, the course of the nation's democracy. Interestingly, Tom, the Founding Fathers also thought that extreme inequality, even though they, they recognized it in their society, was incompatible with democracy. Many of them responded to that by saying, then let's not have democracy. I mean, let's... let's <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, let's, let's remember, at the, at the outset, ba basically, uh, the franchise was extended to white men who owned property yes. or, or paid taxes. Yes. There was, a, there was another current of thought, uh, most uh, vividly expressed by Jefferson, who said, uh, you can't have a society that's democratic where some people own all the land and other people work on it. So let's give everybody some land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's an that was another some possible skin in the game, right? And 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 also then people would not be powerless and could not be influenced unduly influenced by others. So I think that this problem has been recognized uh, since the outset, but I also think that that the problem has become extreme in terms of both the inequalities and the power wielded by economic power in the 20th century. That it's different in an agricultural society where most people say in the northern states owned farms and in a society like the modern United States. So, Christian, how do we begin to judge as a society that's, uh, especially in recent decades, very devoted to market forces, uh, and in all of our history, really, um, but also uh, in principle and in fact devoted to democracy. How do we judge when we're, when we're approaching or at a line that's just too much inequality? How do, how do you know when to say, wait, time out, our democracy is being uh, derailed by too much inequality? How do we discern that? Well, a few ways to discern it might be that economic number that you just cited. I mean, when you start getting to the point, and I think what's really striking in the United States is the extent to which the recovery since 2008 has been a 1% recovery. 95% of the gains since the recovery began gone to the top 1%. Even more on some measures. I mean, um, it, you know, it, it How much more is there? <laughs> no, 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 actually, I mean, um, I brought, I brought some data points myself, Great. and um, between 2009 and 2011, the 1% got 121% of the gains in income. And you may say, how, how could they get 121%? These guys and on Wall Street are geniuses. It's <laughs> because the 99% went down. They went down by 0.4%. Oh, uh, so, okay. Right? And, and what's really striking about that and why it is worth reflecting on is in 2008, a lot of people thought that income inequality had hit a high mm -hmm. and that the financial crisis was, you know, the sort of the death this spasm must be it. of this that must be the system peak. Yeah. and that th the system could not endure, that society would not permit it to keep on going, right? I personally thought that. I actually decided I couldn't write my book anymore because I thought the plutocracy was over. So I had a whole new, I wrote a new book proposal. It was something called like Survivors and it was going to be who endured and adapted to the new system. Mm -hmm. But then it turned out that it actually kept on going. And this is really, really remarkable because the financial crisis in many ways was a product of the same economic forces that are creating this extreme income inequality. But instead of stopping in its tracks, it has continued. So I think that does say to you, it's gone too far. It is not sustainable. And I think you are seeing, I mean, Martin has done some wonderful work documenting mm -hmm. the way in which you do have a correlation between greater inequality and less voice for everybody. So we know that that's not just an idea that we have. Read his research and he shows it. But I think the other thing is we're seeing it in, in lots of less direct ways that the political system is sort of having a seizure too. It, it's just not working. And I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist or even you know, a Harvard or Princeton professor to think that these two things are connected. Martin, how do we judge this? Gone too far, Chris just says, but do we judge it in number terms? If 120% of the recovery has gone to the top 1%, my goodness, that's too much. Do we judge it in outcome terms? Do we have any real apparatus for judging it that matters that's related to back into process and procedure and the way our democracy is structured, or is this just live off in a kind of academic realm by itself, you know, oh, it's a fact, but th there's no connective tissue that lets us address it. Yeah, well, there are ways of addressing it. And let me uh, first say in response to Christia's excellent point about what we've seen since uh, 2009, that, you know, the people at the top of the income distribution have recovered very nicely, both in terms of income, in terms of their wealth, 
and the people in the middle and at the bottom have not. Now imagine if it was the reverse. Would we see the kind of political response or lack of political response that we see today? You mean if 95% of the people had had you know, a great recovery and the top 1% had not? If it was the people at the top that had not recovered. In all honesty, these the days that's hard for me even to, <laughs> look, to picture. Yeah, Absolutely. Right. But, but I mean, uh, really, but we I'm would see a political I'm response of the sort that we saw in 2007, 2008. You mean, oh, the, I see. They, they would, they the would board, it would be a, a disaster. It would be an emergency. We would need intervention. Save the banks. Democrats and Republicans would come together as they did at that point. Huge amounts of government resources would be directed at the problem because it was a problem that affected the affluent. So if we're not seeing that kind of intervention, Alex, is that the evidence that... Uh, inequality has taken our democracy um, out of engagement with the people, the majority of the people. Let me give a slightly sideways answer to that, because I think okay, in the 20th century United States, we've sort of accepted the coexistence of two kinds of institutions, an e a set of economic institutions that would, where there would be great inequality, but the notion was that the political system, democracy, mm -hmm. is a counterweight to that. Mm -hmm. One person, one vote, everybody's vote yeah. counts. Now, it seems to me that the danger of inequality and the point at which you recognize that inequality has gone too far is when those inequalities in the economic system are being replicated in the political system and the wealthy are able to force that replication onto electoral institutions. We've got a lot on the table. We've got a lot to look at. We're talking about democracy and inequality. The first of a big series of investigations sponsored by the Ash Center at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Alex Kesar, Christian Freeland, Martin Gillens, please stand by. To our audience here, thank you for being here. We've got a lot of questions that have already come in on social media and from you in the hall. We will go to them just as soon as we return. This is a special edition of On Point, live from Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We'll be right back. <laughs> How are we doing? Okay, everybody okay? See how fast it goes? Okay, we've got our biggest segment coming right here. Everybody comfortable? We're going to dive right back in. Eileen? James, we good? Good to go. I'm Tom Ashbrook. We're in front of a live audience at the JFK Junior Forum at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and this is On Point. We are talking about democracy and inequality. We have plenty of inequality. Do we have enough democracy these days in the face of all that inequality? With me, on a terrific panel here, Christa Freeland. She is a longtime journalist, now Liberal Party candidate in the, for the Canadian Parliament. She's moved from the realm of looking at this, jumping right into it in Canada, author of Plutocrats. We'll ask her about them. Martin Gillens is with us, professor of politics at Princeton University, author of Affluence and Influence. Alex Kesar is here, professor of history and social poli policy at Harvard's Kennedy School, author of The Right to Vote. We've got inequality aplenty in this country. We know the numbers. They're very big. They're, very, they're as big as they've been in a century and, and by some measures ever. But we also have one person, one vote. So isn't that supposed to be the antidote, Martin? And if it's not working, why not? I mean, you can have all the money you want, but the idea is you've still just got one vote, so we're okay, right? Or not? Elections work, but not as well as they need to. Mm -hmm. So... The research in my book, Affluence and Influence, mm -hmm. looks at how government policymakers respond to what the preferences of the public are, what kinds of policies the public endorses. And what I found is that looking over a period of many decades, from the 1960s on, that policy at the federal level reflects the preferences of affluent Americans, but not those of the middle class or the poor when those preferences diverge. Now, you asked about elections. That is a general trend that the richer you are, the more influence you have over government policy, but there's variation, and one of the things that influences that variation is elections. So I found that in years leading up to presidential elections, mm -hmm. that policy 
more closely reflects the preferences of the public and more equally reflects the preferences of low and high income Americans. Mm -hmm. Now Be that's because the antenna are out, because the sensitivity is high, because the popular vote is very important in that year. Politicians need money, but they need votes as well. Mm -hmm. That's right. And they respond to the public uh, when they need to. And then when elections are over, we see policy reverting to much more closely fo following the preferences of the affluent and of the parties, irrespective of what any member of the public wants. Is your research entirely up to date on that? I mean, after all, in the last electoral round, in the primary season, we saw... Uh, at least in one case, one very rich individual supporting one very prominent candidate who didn't end up doing very well, so well Newt Gingrich, but uh, his, it was one pot of gold that was driving him through the political system. Does that change the kind of findings that you've discovered? For the most part, no. I mean, it's true you can't necessarily buy elections, and plenty of people have tried and failed. Mm -hmm. And we saw that in many cases uh, in the last few election cycles. Um, nevertheless, in order to be a viable candidate in the first place, you need money. And that money comes virtually exclusively from affluent individuals and interest groups. And so while the person with the most money may not win, the person with no money has no chance. Alex, we're so deep into this at this point that I can well imagine Americans saying, you know, surely money has always bought influence in this country. What's new under the sun here? And, and those, those persons would be largely right. I mean, the, the famous quote from Mark Hanna, the campaign manager of Theodore Roosevelt and creator of the modern Republican Party, who said that there's two important things in politics. The first is money, and I can't remember what the second is. Um, yeah, we're talking more than a century <laughs> ago. That, right, that's more than a century ago. I think that part of, uh, I think part of what we're seeing at this particular moment um, is a fairly aggressive use uh, on, the, on the part of some of the elites of this country to increase their own power beyond where it already is, for example, by changing the campaign finance laws and the restrictions which were supposed to regulate and minimize this, mm -hmm. and at the same time making it uh, increasingly difficult for some segments of the working classes and the poor to actually cast their ballots with one person, one vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, the voter, ID, the, the voter ID laws, which are uh, in my informed opinion, preposterous, uh, um, and you know, cutting back on Sunday voting in some states, all of this is, is aimed at reducing the participation, interestingly, the participation of people whose participation rates in the last 34 years is not that high anyway. Is that driven by the wealthy? Is that some rich guy cackling in a room somewhere in front of a fire? <laughs> they won't vote. I'll make it too hard. Is it really driven by... Well, I don't think Wealth? they cackle, but, uh, but are you sure? Uh, but, <laughs> but you know, for ex I mean, but for example, a lot of these voter ID laws are are actually based on a template created by the American Legislative Exchange Council, which mm -hmm. is a conservative group and think tank that is, in fact, funded by wealthy conservatives. Okay. And, and this outfit has written the draft law and sent it out to various states, and they have modified it for local purposes. So you know. I don't want you to be too conspiratorial, but it's not an accident that these voter ID laws and similar laws have cropped up in 32 states simultaneously. Christy, you've written the book, Plutocrats. I mean, you've hung out, you've been on the jets, you've uh, you know, been at the, I don't know, the, the, the polo matches. No um, polo matches. Okay, no, no polo, polo matches. But I mean, you, you've spent time. Um, what's your sense of how those who are in the midst of this very concentrated wealth that we have now think about American politics these days? We know they're of all political stripes, uh, but is there an allergy to full democratic exercise? Is the, do, you, do you hear when you're in those halls of wealth, uh, you know, let's rein this in. Uh, let's, uh, let's be sure our lobbyists have control of this. Uh, Let's not have all those uh, scruffy voters at the polls. They may not agree with our agenda. Is, is there that deliberate kind of view, or does the money just somehow emanate power in itself? Well, one of the things that I found that was actually a real surprise for me and initially a disappointment for my publishers is that, you know, in that lifestyles of the rich and famous kind of way, Super conspicuous consumption is actually less hip and trendy among the plutocrats than you might think. Mm -hmm. Like the really cool thing nowadays is not to have the biggest yacht. The invisible it rich. It is to have <laughs> the most influential think tank. Okay. That's where the real action is. You want to have a think tank, a foundation with the very smartest, you know, ideally Harvard trained scholars 
who are out there coming up with the best policies in line with your own values. <laughs> so yes, there is absolutely, mm -hmm. I think, an outsized and very deliberate effort by actually the very best of the plutocrats to transform their economic power into not necessarily directly political power, but policy power. And actually, when I you think say the I best of, do you mean the richest of, or do you mean the clearest thinkers? Do you I mean, mean the Koch brothers? Do you mean Peter Thiel? What, what, who are you talking about? All of them. Really? And I mean, you know, the, the most engaged, the most energetic. And it's actually quite a complicated thing to think what your response should be. Mm -hmm. Because in general, what I find is when a plutocrat is using his energy and his billions to advance social policies that one personally agrees with, <laughs> one calls that person a brilliant philanthropist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when a plutocrat is using his billions to advance policies that one does not agree with, one calls that a person who is manipulating politics unfairly. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, you know, as you say, you know, you have the Koch brothers and you also have Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. You know, you have people on all sides of the political spectrum. What they have in common is there is this very conscious, very deliberate, not disguised, you know, quite proud um, move to say, okay, I have my billions. It's not enough to be one. One guy said to me, you know, it's not enough to be just another rich guy in New York. I yeah, want to do yeah. something in the world. And so passe. You know, <laughs> it is. You know, there are lots of guys who are rich guys in New York. And, and, and there is a real democracy deficit issue there because with billions in a foundation, you can influence policy without all that pesky work that you used to have to do to build community organizations. I mean, Theta Scotchpaul here at Harvard has written, s has done some great work about how American community organizations have moved from being, you know, people paying a little bit every month and going door to door and talking to lots of people <laughs> in the community to organizations funded by a rich guy with professional staffers who generally, you know, tend to be like a liberal elite and are very happy to not have to go door to door in, you know, the flyover states. Ma Martin Gillens, is it evident that however benevolent or the opposite, any particular uh, wealthy person or uh, concentration of wealth may be, that po American policy has bent toward the interests of the affluent, the wealthy in this era, in this period? Yeah, no question about it. I mean, if you think about sort of the landmark legislative changes that have occurred over the last few decades, things like, uh, you know, the Bush tax cuts or uh, NAFTA, the sort of free trade agreements uh, that have been signed, um, deregulation across a variety of industries, of course, finance among them uh, most prominently. Um, these are all trends that have been supported by both political parties. So while it's true, yes, there are rich Democrats and there's rich Republicans, but they all tend to support these kinds of market-oriented, free trade, uh, you know, deregulatory shifts, which have been massively beneficial to much of, not all, but much of the business uh, community in the United States and to affluent members, uh, affluent uh, Americans, but not so much for the middle class and certainly not for the poor. So we've seen shifts across decades of both parties supporting policies that are favored by and beneficial to the affluent. So let's start to bring in questions here from around the country and from uh, students right here in the hall. This one from a student, Jenny, asks, should a democratic society prioritize economic inequality as an issue to be addressed, given that there are indications that the American people are much more concerned about economic and job growth than they are about inequality. And this does tend to be a kind of American set point. Uh, look, give, give me a job, give us economic growth, let us all in on, uh, on the goodies. Uh, at, at what point do, do you have to turn and address inequality itself? And who decides that? Who adjudicates this? I mean, these are tough questions. I, I think one of the things we have to recognize is that these are not separate issues, that inequality and growth are related in complicated ways that economists debate but that we say we want growth, but w it, it's not enough for that growth to occur only at the top of the income distribution. Mm -hmm. There has to be growth in the middle class and at the bottom, and, tha and we have not seen that over the last few decades. We've seen a lot of growth at the top, and we've seen the middle class stagnate in terms of real wages. Um, and and like to yes. me, that's the key point, mm. right? If we were having this discussion 30 or 40 years ago, then I would have been very happy to say, fine, just push for growth and push for higher productivity, and you are going to see everybody benefit. And that's what you saw happening. But 
what has happened is the way the economy works, and this is not just a US story, it's happened across the Western industrialized democracies, the way the economy work ha works has changed. And really since, you know, people argue, was it since the late 70s, late 80s, late 90s, but there's been a decoupling of increases in productivity and increases in GDP and improved standard of living and wages for the middle class. And that, to me, is the real political, you know, the most urgent political and economic question. You've had growth across the Western industrialized democracies, but for the past 30 years, the middle class has been treading water. That, to me, is not sustainable, and certainly not sustainable when you have democracy. Alex, I see you on this front. Right, I'd, I'd like to jump in here, because it's, it's, also, it's also very important to note that there's a long period, a 30, 40 year period in American history, which economic historians refer to as the Great Compression. Mm -hmm. from the 1940s into the 1970s, okay, when economic growth until the 70s was very high and inequality was at the lowest points it has been in the last century. And a lot of boomers, baby boomers, grew up thinking, this is what America is, absolutely. this is what it means. Right, no, I, ab absolutely right. So the, this notion of inequality or a definite tension between inequality and growth is mistaken. I mean, the growth came in part in the 50s and 60s from, in fact, increases in equality. So l let me ask you, here's a, here's a question or comment from Cody, uh, one of our listeners on Facebook. It says, the top wealthy few can buy the attention of politicians to shape policy in their favor. The rest of us live with what the wealthy decide. Now that's really boiling it down. But <laughs> is there a point at which this is a crisis? And how do we decide? And how do we communicate that? And what, as a, as a democracy that's had periods of compression, of equality, and periods of inequality, uh, you know, w what sort of brings out the fire department if it's a problem? H how do we decide? Who, who rings the bell? You do. <laughs> uh, 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 we just ask questions. <laughs> um, we, don't, we don't know the answer. I mean, I think we've, we've had a financial a, a crisis. You know, we've had one, and that, that didn't seem to ring the bell loudly enough. The public didn't say, holy smokes, enough already, enough with that. But, you know, where's our FDR? Right. They didn't say that. And the electoral system worked as something of a counterweight, electing Ob Obama, you know, as president. Um, I don't, th I don't think it, I don't, you, uh, there isn't an indicator that we can point to and say when things get to this number that, you know, th then we're in crisis. I think that th that will be determined by when enough people mobilize themselves and organize themselves and really just say uh, we've had enough. I mean, to my mind, it, 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 it will be and is being accelerated by the inability of a lot of people to use conventional democratic means in order to combat this excessive influence. Martin uh, Gillens, what, what would you say? I mean, you have the ear of the country as well as the hall. Uh, is our democracy in a crisis because of the level, the historic level of inequality that we have found ourselves at? Is it? And if so, you know, what are the indicators that you would lay out to a populist to say, heads up, it's time for something to be done? Well, we are certainly in a crisis. I mean, we're uh, recording this show while our federal government is shut down. And now, there's been gunfire on Capitol Hill. These are not good reports. But the, uh, th that aspect of the crisis is a function of many things and not just of inequality. Um, you know, I think Alex is right that uh, it's, it's a gradual thing and it's, you know, there's this uh, metaphor of the frog in the water and it gets hotter and hotter. Mm -hmm. and Boil um, the frog. I've, I've heard this isn't really true, but, it, but it, uh, the I, frog for the frog's sake, being I hope boiled. it's not. <laughs> At any rate, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a feeling like that. It's like, when will it be enough? When will, you know, people reach that point? And I, I do think that um, the, the notion that, that you're the one to ring the bell, that there's some truth in that. It's that the media and political elites of all stripes, not just talking about politicians in Washington, uh, you know, it will take that kind of leadership uh, to bring together the, I think, widespread uh, dissatisfaction that exists into and mobilize it politically. And without that kind of leadership, uh, simply having widespread dissatisfaction will not bring change. Christian, we've just got a minute before the break, but do you think the shutdown is a manifestation of this problem, this issue somehow, the government shutdown right now, or is that just an ideological battle that's not to do with inequality? I think it's definitely connected. I think the extreme polarization you're seeing in U.S. politics, I think especially, you know, on the right, that extreme Tea Party populism, that's exactly what you've seen, and you've seen it in other societies. But a lot of those Tea Party people are by no means billionaires. Of course not. 
I mean, you do see right-wing extremism as one response to a, an economically polarized society. That's one direction people can go and one direction in which people can be pushed. What? Oh, I've got questions right there. I've got plenty about why inequality might bring out right-wing extremism, whether it might bring out the opposite. We've seen uh, a candidate for mayor in New York who's talking about a tale of two cities. This is a kind of message of wealth and poverty or inequality in any case that we have not heard at the forefront in American politics in a long time. Now it's there in New York. We'll look at that and much more. We're recording or in the midst of a special edition of On Point for a live audience at the Kennedy School of Government in Cambridge, Massachusetts tonight. Christian Freeland, Martin Gillens, Alex Kesar, it's great to have all of you with us right here. And to the audience in the hall, we'll come to more of your questions after a short break. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We'll be right back. I have no mute button and no invisibility, so you have to bear with my honking in the bandana. Thank you. Uh, good. Comfortable? Good? Ready to go? I think we'll dive right back in. Eileen? Good? One second? One second? <clears throat> I'm Tom Ashbrook. We are in front of a live audience at the JFK Junior Forum at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're talking about democracy and inequality, and this is On Point. We have a great inquisitive audience here and a great panel. Christia Freeland, author of Plutocrats, The Rise of the New Global Super Rich and the Fall of Everyone Else. Martin Gillens, a Princeton University author of Affluence and Influence. Alex Kesar of Harvard, author of The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States. And we are looking at democracy and inequality, the challenge of the new extremes, at least by American historic standards that we're at right now. And if you look at a map of the world on equality by global standards, we are pinning the needle in this country lately. What does that mean for our democracy? Questions. Here's Jack in San Diego, and here's his question. Uh, Chris, I'll put it to you. Inequality of wealth is necessary for wealth creation. Big projects need lots of capital. Right, Christian? You've written for the Financial Times. We need this for capitalism to boom. Well, as Alex has pointed out, we've actually lived through in the world a lot of periods, and in fact, in particular, that post-war era that I think shaped how a lot of us in North America and Western Europe think about how market democracies work. What's really interesting about that time is you had unprecedented growth in this huge swath of the world and you actually had inequality decreasing. You actually had, believe it or not, falling salaries for CEOs. Um, really, it happened. What I was mean, that phrase? I, I didn't quite yeah, catch that yeah. phrase. No, no, they, 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 they were actually declining relative to the wages mm -hmm. paid to their workers. Think about that. We can't, our brains can't even comprehend that anymore. And that also happened to be a period, probably not by accident, that you had huge capital projects undertaken absolutely enormous, both by the private sector and by the public sector. So no, I don't think that you need to have huge wealth concentrated in the hands of a few billionaires in order to have capitalism work. In fact, right now, I'm worried about the opposite. You know, I think that, you know, in the Western world, there's a real risk of getting to the point where if consumers are too squeezed, they are not going to have the spending power to keep the economy going. And you know, one popular explanation of, well not popular, a, a smart explanation of why the credit bubble happened was that that was a way that the sort of political economy worked to mask stagnating incomes. And you had both Democrats and Republicans not wanting to make a big political shift, but saying, oh, okay, let's pump some consumer credit towards the middle class. They'll feel good, they'll spend money, the economy will be booming. Mm -hmm. A Couple of observations from our listeners, Nick writes, Inequality is so intertwined with our democracy, it's hard to tell the difference. And then it's been that way since the founding. I imagine it will continue that way. There's a kind of instinct among Americans not to, not to protest inequality too much, at least lately. You'll tell us about history. And then Ogden goes way back 
Ogden says, according to, according to Aristotle, one either limits inequality or one limits democracy. Ogden writes, Aristotle proposed limiting inequality. Madison J. et al. proposed limiting democracy, a limited democracy, one of unequal shares in the society is the root of our problems. Uh, we'll see if anyone can deny their own privileges to, to admit the truth. W I mean, w we, have, we don't have a perfect version of either. We don't have perfect inequality or equality. We don't have perfect democracy. Uh, but how do we begin, if our history is any guide, to recognize a moment like this and turn back toward some more sustainable equilibrium? Alex. Well, I, I think that part of what we do is to recognize what has worked at some moments in the past. I mean, including, we've alluded several times to this period of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and it was a period when part of what was going on was that, was that state policies, the political system, a democratic political system, was producing state policies that were protecting the, the less privileged members of the society. Um, and I think we, we can look back uh, at that period, because in addition to getting growth and narrowing of inequality, this was also the period when we got Social Security, uh, Medicare, um, and a number of other things which, uh, which were, are basically protective of, of the masses of people. I think that the tension between inequality and democracy is there. It isn't going to go away. I mean, part of what we're talking about is how much is too much, and, and, and how do we protect the in, I guess the inequalities within the economic system from, destro from destroying the political system. But think about triggers in the past, the 40s, 50s, 60s that had this great equality that's so famous, the sort of golden age of American equality. Uh, I mean, d didn't those policies grow out of the first the progressive era and then the New Deal? Those were the trigger moments when the American polity responded to concentration of wealth. Uh, take us back to how those moments were recognized at the time. I mean, we know the New Deal came out of that huge slap across the face and worse of the Great Depression. Uh, what about the progressive movement? What, what was the popular trigger for that great movement? It, it, it's interesting. There, there, in New York State, at least, and this was somewhat uh, national, there actually is a moment in 1905, and historians and political scientists have written that this was the moment when they discovered that business really does corrupt politics. <laughs> now, now th it wasn't the first time it had happened. I mean, you know, uh, the ver... <laughs> The, you know, the, the use of the word railroad as a verb to railroad yeah. something comes in in the 1870s and the 1880s referring to the power of railroad corporations. Railroad money. Right. Railroad But I think, th I think the trigger is, is a combination of recurrent depressions and this recognition that corporate money, unless, you know, unless stopped and, and the money of the wealth will really profoundly uh, corrupt our politics, and then that leads to some changes. That leads to pressure to cre have the direct election of senators, for example, rather than to have senators chosen by state legislatures. And it leads to a banning of corporate money in, uh, in politics, a ban which remained in place until quite recently. But we have the sense today, Martin uh, uh, Gillens, that there's a kind of muted quality to this sort of public <laughs> discourse because the power of, of money influence in politics is so large uh, that it, it steps on these ideas, on these thoughts, on these impulses, and they don't, they don't mount. I, th I think that's true, and I think um, you know, part of it has to do with uh, w what we were talking about earlier in terms of like, who will provide the leadership, who will, who will provide the organizational impetus to shift from simply a, a sort of broad dissatisfaction into something mobilized. And you know, unions have traditionally played that role in this country, as in most Western countries. What do they represent now? Seven percent of American workers. So, so absolutely, six mean, percent. Uh, that's something down there. I mean, that's pretty small. Are they, they are they in a position to do that now? I think they're not, and I think that's part of why we don't see the same kinds of responses today that we might have seen in an earlier era under similar conditions. Well, well, uh, uh, Christian, w where are the governing governing influences here? I mean, for a long time it was maybe the Cold War. I mean, even the people at the top felt like we had to have a showcase democracy economy of some kind that we could brag on to the world and say, this is the way to go. That pressure is off, or maybe it's not. Here's China with an alternate view saying, I mean, they're going to be at this uh, big Asian conference where I guess President Obama will not. Will they not be sort of pointing across the Pacific to the United States in all of its disarray and saying, you want to go down that democratic road? Is there pressure from, uh, from that uh, dynamic now or not? 
Well, I think that's an excellent point. And actually, I had written down here as Alex was talking Bolshevik revolution, because I think that's something that we tend to forget when we think about what actually, you know, with hindsight, was this really magnificent response of Western capitalism to all the strains and inequalities of the Industrial Revolution. Like, when you think back, you know, that was the previous real peak of inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, the rich guys had a huge amount of power. We didn't yet have the idea of mass democracy. And actually, they decided to share. And they decided to share in, you know, most of the Western industrialized world, in Canada, in the United States, in Western Europe, build up these great social institutions, actually allow inequality to shrink. And it's sort of amazing that that sort of generosity and long-sightedness, when you read some of the debates from the 20s and 30s, part of what was going on was looking east and seeing what had happened to their brethren in Russia who had not chosen to share. Mm -hmm. And that was total confiscation and actual, com you know, real, full blood, fully fledged communism. And so I think that that, you know, existence of an alternative that really scared the capitalist class and also offered to people who were radical on the left an idea that there was a different way you could live was quite energizing. Something that I think is difficult for everybody today is, you know, sure, Beijing and Shanghai right now might be laughing at the United States and saying, you know, your democracy doesn't really Shut work. Shut down, ha-ha. But I don't think that there are too many people in the United States who think, gee, I really want to be governed in the way the Chinese are governed. Gee, that's a really effective, yeah, yeah, wonderful, some of that. appealing yeah. way to live. <laughs> and, and, and that's a difference. Th there was a time when a lot of people felt, if not fully blown communism, certainly socialism, w was a real and effective way to run an economy. I think part mm. of our problem is, we sort of see that inequality is rising, we see that that's a huge problem, we see the middle class is stagnating, but I think we don't yet have a clear set of economic solutions. You know, how do you stop, you don't want to stop the technology revolution, you don't want to stop globalization. Which produces a lot of fortunes. You don't want to stop mm -hmm. globalization, and they mm -hmm. don't just produce fortunes, they're hollowing out the middle class, and yet they're basically good. So how do you rein these things in? Uh, but you don't want to rein in uh, technological advancement. Right. How do you have a decent economy if you do? Um, and, 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 I mean, Martin, I don't even see countervailing pressures globally. Globalization has created, um, in part, uh, we're told, has created inequality in many countries. China's got plenty of inequality. Y even Europe and even the Scandinavian countries, inequality has grown in recent years. Even Canada. Even Canada. <laughs> uh, though uh, Europe's social mobility at this point is still higher than ours. I don't know about Canada's compared ours to yours. Ours is higher than yours, Canada's yes. Canada's higher. Oh, everybody's higher than ours. We just can't uh, stand it. Uh, 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 but it's true. But does that take the pressure off? Um, the American, uh, what, concentrations of wealth to look around and say we have to do better if there's concentration everywhere. Is this just a global situation now? Well, I think we have to recognize both the global forces that are impacting all of these societies and pushing things in a more unequal direction and that different societies have responded very differently to those forces. Right, so in Western Europe, over the last 30 years, this period of cons uh, considerable globalization policies have shifted in a way to minimize the resulting inequalities, whereas in the United States, mm -hmm. our social policies have gone in the opposite direction with less progressive taxes and, mm -hmm. and so on, so that we've ended up not just not fighting against these sort of global forces, but actually accelerating their impact. And so, you know, we have to recognize that there's both sides to that coin and that we do have choices and that the political systems are important in shaping the kinds of policies that are adopted and the, therefore the impact on people's lives. Uh, let's imagine an alternative universe where these things are not being driven further, but rather we had leadership in Washington that said, you know, for the health of our democracy, our polity at, at large, we, we want to rein in the inequality a little bit. Yes, we'll still have plenty of rich people, but some of these extremes, let's bring them back. We don't want to crush the economy. We don't want to stop growth. What kind of policies, if, if there were politically possible, an open field, where we wanted to maintain um, you know, a market system, economic growth, not opposed to, to plenty of inequality, just not so crazy extreme. What kind of policies might help rein that in, Alex? Well, you know, there, I think the traditional policies, I think you would raise taxes in a progressive way 
Um, you know, the fact is also during this period of the Great Compression, the highest income tax rate in the United States was about 75 percent. Now, we couldn't get it all the way back to 75 percent now, but I, I think that you can have increases in, uh, in taxes. And you, you I mean, Ronald Reagan would say, wrong, D drop them down, you're going to have more growth. He would, uh, right. And, and David stopped. And he did, and he did. Uh, but, but, you know. Deficits, uh, too. Uh, right, right, exactly. I mean, you can, you, you, you can have uh, his own kind of Keynesianism, which mm -hmm. did it. Um, but you could, you could increase government revenues in, uh, in that way, and you could strengthen and build not only, not only this, the traditional safety nets, but it seems to me, if one reads a number of analyses of what's going on in our labor force and the needs for people to have different kinds of education and training, that we really need a very, very large-scale set of programs to train and educate people for 21st century jobs. And there is no reason in the world. I mean, in fact, in fact, this was an idea put forward by Robert Reich when he was Secretary of Labor uh, 20 years ago. There, these are, this is not pie in the sky. And these are the kinds of things that are happening in, uh, in, in Western Europe. Martin, you know that there are plenty of Americans who say you build those safety nets too thick and deep and cushy, and they undermine social values. They undermine initiative. They actually end up undercutting economic growth. There absolutely has always been, throughout our history, a concern about uh, the uh, sort of, you know, effects on incentives that these kinds of programs will have, that, that ch even private charity has. Um, but the fact is that despite those concerns, most Americans think we need to be doing more to help the underprivileged. I mean, we're looking at the gap in test scores between rich and poor children is now 30 to 40 percent wider than 25 years ago. But we need those children to be productive members of society. Something's off. That's absolutely right. And I think if we talk about what kinds of social policy change we need, the most important policies are those that impact everything, which is to say campaign finance regulations. Uh -huh. the, the role of money in politics is so important and so influential across the range of what other kinds of policies we can successfully adopt that that's where we need to focus a lot of attention. Christian, getting to those things, you know how hard it is in this country. Look at Washington right now. I mean, there's, you can paint a scenario of, oh, yes, we'll, we'll think these thoughts, then we'll just go do these things and everybody will be happy. We could just as well end up at the Alamo. I mean, we're kind of at the Alamo right now. Uh, do you see this country working this out, or do you see us wending our way deeper in here until we get in some sort of deeper fix in terms of the, the healthy exercise of democracy than we're in now? Well, Tom, I am really an optimist, and I guess that is reflected in my decision to go out and try to do something in For my Canada. home. Well, no, directly, <laughs> right? And we're facing the same issues, and that's I exactly my personal motivation. And I do think a council of despair is completely the wrong thing here. And I think also, sure, this is a huge problem. It's really complicated. It's really big. But we as human beings have dealt with huge problems before. Right? You know, our grandparents fought the Second World War. Pretty big problem. They did it. We've been talking now about the progressive era and the New Deal. In some ways, that was a bigger lift than what we're talking about now because people were poorer and they didn't have the template of what a social, demo you know, of what real mass democracy looked like. They were moving from rural to urban and they were inventing everything from scratch. So, yeah, I think that this is definitely doable. And one thing that I would say is we shouldn't think about, you know, that someone's going to ring a bell and say, okay, this is it. We've hit the point of no return. We have to do something differently. I think that everybody who thinks that this is a big issue, and if you don't think it's a big issue, then you're not awake, um, needs to really think about what can I do about it. I really think, you know, that sounds really simple, but... There is, in fact, a democracy, and if people actually mobilize themselves, you are going to make a difference. We are going to make a difference. That doesn't mean, <coughs> that doesn't mean it'll be easy. Big heads up. We are at a historic moment. I think we've established that tonight, that alone, to focus on that, to think about that. Our thanks to the Ash Center here at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University for raising these issues of challenges to democracy tonight. My thanks to our Sorry. guests, Christian Freeland, Alex Kesar, and Martin Gillens for being with us, and to the whole audience and all of your questions from the hall and around the country. Thank you very much. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. Another mic? Is there is there a is there a hand mic that uh, is there? I'll just I'll leave it on. What the heck? I'm a, I'm a radio guy. I won't be ashamed to have a headphones on. Okay, so th there it is. You see how fast the show goes.
You see how short an hour is? Thank you, everybody. We, we have a few minutes. If there's a hand mic, it would be a little more comfortable. I don't know if it's still around. Um, we have a few minutes to take your questions right here in the hall. Uh, we can talk about this. We can talk about wh what it's like to talk about this. We can talk about the strength and, and, and weaknesses of uh, the media handling of this. Um, whatever you like. Uh, there are ground rules for a JFK Jr. forum uh, back and forth. Um, all questioners must identify themselves. All questioners must identify themselves. One brief question per person. No speeches. And questions end with a question mark. I don't even always do that, but you're required to. So um, let's go right here. All right, thank you. My name is Max Liebeskin. I'm a freshman here at Harvard College. And I have a question sort of about the policy debate that you were having about what's caused inequality. Clearly, fin the financial deregulation that happened in the 90s and that continued to happen during the Bush administration to some extent made it a lot easier for the rich to get richer. But what specific policy changes over, say, the last three to four decades do you think have made it, have explicitly made it harder for the poorer Americans to access economic growth? I'll pass it around. Martin? Uh, boy, that's a big question, and I don't think we really know the answer, and I certainly wouldn't claim to know the answer. Um, all right, that's it. all I've got to say. <laughs> okay, so I have to agree with that, but I would say I think the answer falls in three areas. I think a technology revolution is having a huge impact, and I think it's only getting started. You know, we're accustomed to technology having hollowed out the manufacturing jobs, but it's moving into the white collar ones, right? When's the last time any one of us used the services of a human travel agent? Um, and that's moving. I talked to an investor this week who said pretty soon there aren't gonna be any waitresses anymore because they're inventing computers that will just be at our tables that will do all of that. So there you go. So, you know, technology, definitely a factor. Globalization, for sure, also a factor. And then, as Martin suggested, there are, are lots of political decisions um, that can either push, you know, lean into those changes or can soften them. I think deregulation is one. I think weakening unions is another. Uh, I think, you know, tax policy makes a very big difference. And, you know, how strong or weak the social safety net is. I think we've covered the basis here. Okay, good. I mean, I'll just read here from The Economist. I think this came out today saying, talking about um, America's tax code is riddled with distortions that favor the rich, from the loopholes benefiting private equity to the mortgage interest deduction, an enormous subsidy for those who buy big houses, a simpler, flatter code with no exemptions would be more efficient and more progressive, and maybe that turns around and helps the poor. Let's get one right here, if we may. Sir. Hi. Uh, remember the rules? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Paulo. I'm a senior studying economics at Harvard, and my question is for Professor Gillens. You mentioned in one of the policy recommendations that we should we should try to approach inequality with universalistic policies, policies that are not targeted directly towards the poor, but towards, you said, campaign financing and the superstructure of politics. Why could could you support that argument a little bit further? And also in light of the fact that a lot of the major social safety nets are directed at the poor specifically and are not universalistic policies. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good question. And um, I, I may have been uh, somewhat misunderstood here. I think campaign finance reform is so important because it shapes all of the other kinds of policies, all of these economic policies. It really shapes what is possible um, because it changes the incentives of uh, elected representatives. So that's why I think that's like a central concern uh, going forward. Um, in terms of like, policies that are targeted versus universal, um, I actually agree more with, uh, with your point of view there that um, uh, while universal policies can generate broader political support, things like Social Security and Medicare and so on, um, that nonetheless, targeted policies uh, of certain kinds um, that reward work, that provide um, uh, incentives and uh, assistance to people to make it on their own are actually extremely popular among the American public. And the first book uh, that, I, that I wrote um, about the welfare state um, makes exactly that argument, that the opposition to welfare per se, that is to cash assistance to poor people, has been misconstrued as a broad opposition to anti-poverty policy. Whereas in fact, there's great support among middle class and even to a great extent among affluent Americans for many anti-poverty policies, including things like raising the minimum wage, whose real value has been declining over the last few decades, 
um, and so on. So I do think actually targeted policies are an important part of that mix, but we're not going to get them, we're not going to get enough of them without effective campaign finance reform. Hi, my name is Madeline Lear. I'm a freshman at the college and a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. On behalf of the forum, I'm going to be asking the official Twitter question of the night. And this is from Dan Raza for Krista Freeland. How do you plan to discuss income inequality at the doors of voters and connect it to their every day? How do you plan to discuss income inequality at the doors of voters and connect it to their every day? Yes, okay, well, I've actually been campaigning already, and I won my nomination a couple of weeks ago, so I've been doing it. Um, thank you. Uh, and it was a question I was asked a lot when I first decided to do this, because people, including my friends, said, you know, okay, like, it was interesting book and all that, but will the voters of Toronto Centre actually care? And one of the real revelatory and kind of inspiring things that I've found, you know, and like, I'm an actual politician now. I knock on people's doors at 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon and say hello. Yeah, and people, actually, people are very nice, much nicer than I would be. Like, they thank you for coming, and they talk to you and stuff. Um, there you go. Um, but what I have found so far is people are so interested in this issue, um, even without me raising it, less so framed as inequality and more framed as a squeezed middle class. And what I've really found is that that's something that proactively most people I talk to are bringing up. And whether it is young people um, who have just graduated, graduated from university, have a degree, did all the right things, can't get a job, are still living with the parents, the parents of these people who have them now living in their basements and are not too thrilled about it. I've talked to a lot of people who say, it's not that I've lost my job, but I see that my friends are losing their jobs, or I'm being pushed from a job with full benefits into contract work, and I sort of feel like it's the thin edge of the wedge. And then I talk to a lot of people who would like to be a retired person, and they're not able to retire. And so I, I don't think that this is an academic, you know, this is a very academic setting in which to be talking about it. I think, and, and look, and, and the squeeze is not as profound in Canada as it is in the United States, but it's still, I would say, the number one issue for most people I talk to. So, so, so it just comes right up. Thank you. Uh, question here, please. We've just got time for a couple more. Great. Hi, I'm David Cleddy. Um, I am a freshman at Harvard College, and my question is for all of you, and it's, um, do any of you feel that America is moving more towards what Professor Levisky at Harvard University states, a competitive authoritarianism or aristocracy, and where there are institutions of democracy, but there is an unfair playing field that favors the elite? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> At least one of us believes that. Um, yeah, I mean, I look. I, th I, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know about Steve Levitsky's competitive authoritarian. But I don't. You know, that that's not that's not the issue the issue for us. But certainly, what we're talking about is a profoundly unfair playing field, right? I mean, that that that's, you know, that really is what we're talking about. I mean, another, you know, one dimension. We've talked a little bit about the social mobility figures, and that now social mobility here is somewhere a little bit below Malaysia's. Um, but it's, al it's also that there's this tremendous process of class replication going on. The, you know, if, you're, if you are born into a family in the upper 10% of the income strata, the odds are overwhelming that that's where you will go yourself. And the same if you're born into the bottom quarter. That, you know, that is an unfair playing field, and that is very much where we've been, and it seems the field be, seems to be becoming more rather than less tilted, and that's, I think, what, what motivates a lot of our concern. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wonder, uh, politically, when this kind of language gets uh, engaged here, uh, there was a time that it wasn't very popular, but on the other hand, a lot of Americans who came to this country as immigrants, which is most of us, came to get away from exactly that kind of situation. I mean, my first came from Belfast in 1682 as an indentured servant. I doubt they were too fond of aristocrats. Uh, I have been in the serfs quarters in Sweden where my great-great-grandmother Hedda was the last child. Who There was nothing left. She walked out. They were so small, I cannot stand upright by any means in those houses. In, in my family, at least, the... the um, 
the story of coming to this country to get away from aristocracy was a very strong and potent one. Uh, you could not mention the name of the king of Sweden for several generations in our house. Now, you know, it's beloved, but, but I wonder when, it, when and how and if that might get, uh, that, that sort of old part of American life may, might get, uh, might get uh, uh, initiated or, or sparked again, that perspective on the world. Well, look at me, I think I've just run out our clock and all of you nice people standing at the microphones. I'm sorry, but I'm getting the rapid sign. Um, this has been great. Uh, thank you for participating in the uh, production, in effect, of, uh, of our NPR show here tonight. You've been a wonderful audience. I'm sorry we can't get to everything, but the conversation, as we always say, will go on at onpointradio.org, and it will go on here through the Ash Center for the next two years. So I'm really grateful to all of you. I wish very good luck to the Ash Center. I think it's great that you're focusing on this. I hope it gets more and more and more concrete as you walk through these next two years and that we all see um, blue skies ahead. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there are any under, undergraduates here, I'd like to invite you, undergraduates from Harvard, 